Hello and welcome to Bix Gardener's Web Seminar. My name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at Bix Gardener. And uh, today we have Andy Stumer talking about media milling uh, deep dive, um, going into all the intricacies of media milling. Um, we possibly will have some time for questions. Um, if you do have any, please enter them in the chat function down in your uh, bottom right hand corner of your screen. We'll get to them. Um, if for some reason we do run out of time, uh, we'll follow up with you directly and, and get those questions answered. We are also recording this and immediately following the presentation, you'll receive an automated email uh, with that link. Feel free to uh, view it later, share it with colleagues, uh, whatever you like. So with that, um, Andy, it's all yours, sir. Take it away. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you everybody for joining today. Um, on this uh, seminar about the uh, media milling deep dive. Um, so this is actually the second part of a presentation. Uh, the first part was a few months ago about dissolving, uh, the deep dive and dissolving. And so this is the second part. Uh, like John said at the end, if you have any questions, please write them in a text uh, field and I'll try to answer those and get through them. Uh, so just we're going to start out with a quick introduction about who the company is, VMA, and the relationship with BIC, uh, the dispersion process, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of equipment that we offer from laboratory all the way up to production scale. Uh, we discuss QC um, capabilities as well as lab capabilities here in Wallingford, Connecticut, where we have a really state-of-the-art uh, applications laboratory since two years ago, and also our applications lab in Germany. So the uh, company VMA Getzmann um, is the producer of these dispermats. Um, the company was founded uh, about 50 years ago in Germany uh, by Mr. Hermann and Elke Getzmann, uh, the couple on top, right? Um, Mr. Getzmann is actually still involved in the business today. Um, he wants to ensure that the uh, designers still follow his uh, design philosophy. Um, and he comes into the company about twice a week um, and still is actively involved in uh, helping with the design of new equipment. Um, BIC has had the ex exclusive distribution rights for North America uh, since 1988. Um, the company is now run by the two sons, uh, Christian and Martin. Uh, so it's still in family hands. Uh, right now, they have about 100 employees uh, globally and uh, eight people just in the design department. About 40% of everything that VMA Getsman designs is custom. Uh, and they are, of course, known to make high-end dissolvers, uh, bead mills, uh, basket mills from laboratory, but pilot all the way up to production scale. Uh, the dispermat right there on the bottom right picture is actually the first dispermat uh, that was uh, introduced in the early 70s. And we still have customers today that are still running the original dispermat. The motors are still working. The only thing that they updated were the control boxes. So that speaks volumes uh, about the quality of the, of the motor and build in general. So on this slide here, uh, you can see this building right here is the new addition to VMA. Uh, so there is a new design center uh, as well as office space. And uh, the company is located about 30 miles east of Cologne, which is kind of in the center of Germany. Uh, like I said, they're very flexible to customers requirements. About 40% of what they make is custom. Uh, and they provide, provide complete solutions for lab all the way up to uh, production scale. And then we have some really uh, nice laboratories uh, at VMA in Germany, as well as in Wallingford, which we will be discussing towards the end of the presentation. Okay, um, so we have uh, product lines, obviously they're used in many different areas. And then we just differentiate, obviously, mainly uh, to disperse pigments. So we <clears throat> use this type of equipment to disperse organic pigments, inorganic pigments, functional pigments, and also special effect pigments as well. If you didn't know, our sister company is Eckert. They are a producer of high-end metallic flakes, silver flakes, um, 
and they are also using our technology uh, to produce a better product. The whole idea is to improve glass, uh, the transparency of the product, color is improved, pictorial strength, as well as cleanliness of shade. These are all improvements that we would see if we disperse or mill our products the right way. Um, so here's a summary of why we are really dispersing and milling. So of course we want to achieve better wetting of our pigments. Uh, we want to not destroy the pigments, but we want to really break up these uh, invisible binding forces that hold our pigment particles together. Uh, they are called Van der Waal forces. And with enough shear, uh, we're able to actually break up these binding forces. They're almost like invisible magnetic forces that are tying these primary particles together, these larger agglomerates. And then we want to break those up and turn them into aggregates. And when we are media milling with the media, we actually turn them back down into uh, the primary particle size. Uh, so that is the whole idea of, 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 of the milling process. And that, of course, if we do it right, will give us better color, improved gloss. Uh, the overall appearance will benefit from a proper dispersion. Um, we're going to save money because if I can properly disperse pigment, I can use less pigment in my formulation that will help us obviously save money on raw material costs. We will have better product consistency from batch to batch. Um, also, uh, it helps us of, of course improve our formulation. And then uh, finally, we will get much better particle size distribution as well as uh, uh, much better upscale results, which is important if I wanna go from laboratory to pilot and then in, into manufacturing. So these are all very important aspects of uh, dispersing and milling and uh, why, why we uh, need to do a good job. Okay, so here are some of the issues that we are having. Uh, if we improperly disperse our pigments, obviously that would lead to poor color and poor color stability. Uh, our pigments will flocculate back together. Um, of course, there is additives that we can put into our formulation. Our sister company, Big Additives, as you probably are familiar with, has some uh, good solutions to help you avoid this problem. Uh, sagging, leveling, and then settling uh, are some of the other issues that would occur with an improper dispersion. Uh, and then obviously gloss is another one uh, that we see a lot of if, if, if pigments are not properly dispersed, that really has a negative impact on our glass levels. And then at the end, the separation uh, also is a big problem. Um, so here are some critical uh, pigment dispersion properties. So the first one obviously is the stability. So uh, pigments uh, are better when they have strong color fastness and that will also help with the stability and fading over time. Um, brightness. Obviously, uh, the better the dispersion, the higher quality, my color and um, pigment size. Obviously, the rule of thumb there is uh, the smaller my pigment particles, uh, the better the transparency, the better the color. And again, I can save money by producing a better dispersion, by reducing the part particle size because I have to use uh, less pigment uh, to uh, achieve a good product. And then uh, viscosity is really critical. Uh, we want to always hit the sweet spot. And usually the lower the viscosity uh, will help us improve our particle size distribution. It's also better for uh, processing uh, the material during the dispersion process. So right there, uh, we are looking usually between 1,000 to 5,000 centipoise. That's an ideal range. Uh, of course, the equipment will also handle larger viscosities. Uh, we have some different technologies for very, very uh, high viscosity ranges that can help us there as well. But uh, usually around 1,000, 5,000 centipoise is usually the sweet spot to really um, have a proper viscosity to achieve the best dispersing results. Okay, so what is really important to remember in a nutshell here is that we are not destroying the pigments. The idea is really that we are just breaking up these binding forces and, uh, and basically turn these larger agglomerates into aggregates and then reduce them down to the primary particle size by breaking up these uh, invisible forces. So to achieve that, the shear forces are really responsible uh, for that separation. 
or the breakup of these binding forces. So when we're dispersing, we actually use a cow's blade. And then when we are done with our pre-dispersion and we uh, hit the uh, smaller particle size, the aggregate level down from the agglomerates, uh, then to go down to the primary particle size, we want to do the media milling where we actually use a rotor and media to give us that additional uh, shear. And that will allow us to then really go down to the primary particle size. But we'll cover that in more detail uh, a few slides down, down the way. Uh, and then at the end, obviously, once we have completed our milling or dispersing and milling process, we want to use the right additives to really keep those uh, primary particles in a, in a suspended state. So this slide um, is just to show you the difference between different pigment types, uh, just to give you an idea uh, of some of these uh, uh, primary particle sizes, uh, what that looks like under the microscope. Um, so here is a great slide that explains um, how this um, particle size reduction actually works. So in the beginning, we have these larger clusters of uh, particles, we call them agglomerates. Uh, these blocks are bound together by these van der Waal forces, and we use the shear blade to really break up the binding forces and then turn them into the aggregate uh, level, which are just smaller blocks of of these pigment uh, particles. And then at the end, for, go from the aggregate level down to the primary particle level, uh, we really uh, need to do the media milling, which we cover in depth today. And that is actually um, uh, the, the most important part uh, by using uh, the right type of media mill. So here you can see um, the steps. Uh, first, we're actually wetting. Uh, we use the cow's blade and then the breakup of these uh, larger particles with the cow's blade again. And then uh, for the fine grinding and media milling, we then use a rotor and media. There's different types of, of bead milling uh, technologies we'll cover. And then uh, finally, we're going to stabilize these particles in a suspended state uh, to make sure that they don't flocculate back together. So this is a slide that just outlines at what point it is recommended to move from a dissolver, which does our predispersion with the cow's blade, over to the actual milling process. And you can see the larger particles, or well, in the beginning when I'm making my mill base, I use the cow's blade before I actually start the milling, the medium milling process. Uh, so the large particles are actually broken down to uh, roughly 10 microns of particle size. So the, the range there is what we are seeing is between 10 and 20 microns is actually kind of a good range. Uh, and then uh, you really don't have enough shear anymore to really further reduce these agglomerates and break them down to the primary particle size. So if we want to go down to, uh, you know, small micron range or even nano range, then we really need to move over to the bead mills and that will allow us then to really uh, go down much, much smaller, all the way down to sub-50 nanometers, uh, provided that I have the right equipment. So we have a number of different solutions uh, for the laboratory as well as production. Uh, so one very important um, a, a part of it is the uh, pre-dispersion, the tip speed. Uh, what we are looking for is between 18 to 25 meters per second of peripheral speed of your blade. Uh, that is a sweet spot. Uh, that, that window there will allow us to really properly disperse or predisperse our pigment. And then we can move over uh, to fine dispersing or milling once we achieve that uh, smaller particle size between 20, 10 to 20 microns. And then we can use these different technologies. Either we use vertical bead mills, uh, we can use basket mills or horizontal bead mills, which some of you are probably very familiar with. Uh, and there we need to look at uh, uh, that we don't uh, go below 10 meters per second of tape of rotor speed or exceed 16 meters per second. So this is a really good range um, to achieve uh, a proper uh, milling uh, process. And then we'll cover some of these different 
uh, pieces of equipment that we offer um, in, in, in uh, our uh, dis Dispromat range. Okay, um, so when we uh, start the pre-dispersion process, just quickly, uh, it's really important that I have the right relationship uh, between uh, the ratio between my blade diameter and also my container diameter. If it's too large or too small, then I will not get the proper predispersing effect, uh, and I will also not see uh, what we call a donut. We will cover that in a moment here. This is the visual cue of what I see when I'm actually predispersing. What? How is my material behaving uh, during the dispersing process? So. Um, we have also this chart online at vmagetsman.com. You can see that uh, you have a range of blade diameters that you can use for each different vessel uh, size. So depending on the viscosity of your material, you can either go up or down in the blade diameter and basically with trial identify uh, the right blade for your dispersion or dispersing process. Uh, that you're optimizing it and that you get the optimum donut effect. So the uh, tape speed is one of the most critical values uh, that we look at. Uh, this is a formula you may want to write it down or we will share the presentation. Uh, it's pi times the diameter of, of your blade times the RPMs. Um, and that will give us the uh, tape speed. If you want to do this in metric, you divide the whole um, in uh, uh, formula by 60, uh, and that will give you meters per second. Okay. So here is a, a picture of a, of a good looking donut. Uh, that's the visual cue that uh, allows us to uh, under, basically see right away, am I properly dispersing? Have I optimized my formulation? Do I have the right viscosity? And am I effective in breaking up these, these, these particles? So in order for us uh, to optimize our dispersion results prior to milling, we need to watch out for a few uh, different key elements here. So number one is how long am I dispersing? Um, do I get the donut effects? But if, of course, there's different types of viscosity ranges. Um, if my viscosity is too low, let's say below 1,000 centipoise, then I might have difficulty getting a donut effect. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm not properly dispersing. It just so happens that my viscosity is so low that the donut would collapse uh, because of my viscosity. Uh, but I would still uh, possibly achieve the desired predispersion effect. Um, and then obviously if my viscosity is too high, then I won't be able to get a donut either uh, because it won't form properly. Um, so again, the tape speed is really important there. Uh, it's 18 to 25 meters per second. Uh, we want to make sure we use the right uh, blade diameter compared to our container diameter. And then obviously there's different type of dissolver discs or cowl's blade or heli discs, some people call them. Then I have to pick depending on my viscosity uh, to achieve the best uh, result. And then what is my volume in my container? Usually the rule of thumb is about 50 to 70% of fill rate. We don't want to go higher or we're going to have spilling. And then if we are too low, then it won't allow me to properly adjust my blade inside of the container and oscillate. Uh, that's sometimes important if the product uh, isn't moving properly, if it's dixotropic, sometimes I have to move my blade up and down in the container. So if I don't have enough mill base, that gets more difficult to do, and that will impact, obviously, my, my predispersion result. Um, from a formulation standpoint, pigment and filler concentration should be optimized. I want to keep my temperature as low as possible because I'm putting heat into my process during my uh, dispersing uh, process, I'm adding a lot of energy, so automatically the temperature would increase. So especially when we are milling, this is very important that we are properly uh, chilling our uh, containers. We have double wall containers that can do that. Or in the case of uh, a basket mill, we are also able to uh, mill, uh, 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 chill our double wall uh, uh, basket mills. Um, but we'll cover that in more detail. And then at the end, again, the additives are really important uh, to uh, get us to the best result and that we don't flocculate 
uh, that the pigments don't flocculate back together. And then when we have achieved the right particle size, that's when we actually start uh, the bead milling process. So here are some of the key differences. Uh, the dissolver with the cowl's blade, obviously, I'm limited to the amount of energy I can put in because I'm only using a blade. Uh, it's only there to deagglomerate and turn the particle that the, the larger clusters of particles back to the aggregate level. Uh, so these agglomerates down to the aggregate level. And then we're not achieving primary particle size with only using a cow's blade. Uh, but it is very important that we do the pre-dispersion with the dissolver prior to actually the bead milling process. The reason is, is because if my particles are too big, then my uh, media, uh, the kinetic energy of my media will not be high enough to really break up these binding forces. Additionally, I have a screen uh, that will clog up if the particles are uh, too high, and then I will not have any uh, movement of my product through my mills. Uh, and that will then obviously uh, cause other problems. And then if I'm only using a cow's blade and not milling, that leads us to a poor quality product. Uh, an example would be that our color strength is very limited, our gloss is poor, and a number of other things we already covered. Um, so the media mill is important because I'm breaking down to the uh, primary particle size. I can put in a lot of energy, uh, and it uh, obviously leads us to a much better looking product uh, due to a lower particle size, better particle size distribution, and uh, some of the other key benefits that uh, we already covered on previous slides. Okay, so what is actually happening in a bead mill? So inside of a bead mill, I have a rotor, and then I have these beads. And as the uh, rotor spins at a high velocity, these beads start moving around my milling chamber, and actually they are colliding towards each other. And what happens there is these pigment particles are ba basically getting thrown around in, in my milling chamber, and just by the sheer force of these beads coming together, uh, the, at high velocities, these pigments are getting sheared. And that's what's causing up the breakup of these binding forces. It's not that they're necessarily getting crushed. Of course, some of them will get crushed, but the probability is actually very low. The separation really takes place from the, sh the shearing and the particles getting pushed away at high velocity when the beads are colliding. It's almost like when you're in a bathtub and you have a rubber duck and you try to squish it and then catch it and you just put your hands together and then the rubber duck will always usually fly away. Imagine that at a very high velocity and that's what kind of takes place inside of these uh, bead mills and that will, will, will actually break down these particles. Okay. Uh, so kinetic energy is very important and that is actually the force of my beads hitting my uh, particles. So here is a formula that you might want to uh, write down or, or wait until you get the presentation on how you actually calculate that kinetic energy. And the reason the kinetic energy is so important is uh, because imagine uh, this, this nail right there. If I have a, a small hammer, uh, it would take me many, many blows to really put that nail into my piece of wood right there. Uh, if I increase the weight of my hammer and the size, I don't need that many blows. I may only need one impact and I'm able to drive that nail into my board. Um, so that's kind of the same idea when we're talking about media milling. So that the heavier my beads, um, the more uh, kinetic energy I'll have and the higher uh, my probability of breaking up uh, these binding forces. So there is different beads on the market and obviously a lot of customers always look at cost. And glass beads, we all know, are relatively inexpensive compared to like a zirconium stabilized bead or yttrium. So you really have to ask yourself, where do I spend my money? And what we found is, is that buying higher quality beads will usually lead to much faster and better milling results. So that's actually an area where money is well spent. Uh, the other issues that you would have by using uh, glass beads would be uh, obviously the hardness, right? So they are much softer, they break easier, 
And that would also lead you to have more uh, debris, glass shards in your mill base, which you then have to filter out. If you have a higher quality uh, bead that will not break up, it'll just wear down over time. Uh, you won't have any type of cross-contamination. Uh, the uh, milling process will also be more stable because you have more even bead sizes. And over time, you will notice that you get much more reliable milling results as a, as, as a result of using better quality beads that have a much more even wear. Um, so obviously, you can see the hardness of a glass bead uh, compared to a zirconium oxide bead is much lower. So the, the also the weight is much lower. So obviously, you can see based on these numbers alone, a uh, higher quality bead uh, will be much, much better uh, in my dispersing or milling process than I, uh, I, would, I would get with uh, just a standard glass bead. So always uh, make sure you look at that. Also, uh, these beads will last a lot longer, and therefore you won't need as many of these beads or recycle them as often, so you will also save money just on the longevity of my, my material, whereas the glass beads I will have to replace a lot more often, and again, I will have more inconsistent milling results because of my uh, uh, bead quality. Okay, uh, I really like this slide a lot because it shows you kind of uh, where this separation really takes place. So you have these beads right there. Um, and then uh, my pigment particles, my aggregates are in here in this corner, right? So as the beads drift together, now that gets pushed out and that results in these binding forces actually getting broken up and then turning these aggregates down to the primary particle size level. And that's why we are milling. Um, that's the reason. We're not trying to destroy our pigments. Uh, we're making them strictly smaller by breaking up these binding forces and reducing them to the primary particle size. That's really important to remember because some people uh, think that when you're milling, you're actually destroying your pigments and then you are uh, reducing the particle size that way. That is really not the intent of, 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 of the milling process. It's really just to go down to the primary particle size. So these are some of the key uh, parameters that really influence uh, our process when we are milling and, 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 and the results uh, uh, thereof. So particle size after predispersion again, 10 to 20 microns as a rule of thumb uh, is what you're looking for. Uh, choose the right bead type and weight and also bead size. Obviously, if I'm using beads that are too small and my particles are still too large, for example, if I'm having uh, 20 micron particles, I don't want to use 0 0.2 millimeter beads because I'm not going to have enough kinetic energy to really break up the binding forces of my larger particle clusters. So I always have to look at and measure what is my starting particle size when I'm milling, and then I would select the right bead size according to that number. Um, and then obviously the amount of beads is critical. You don't want to use uh, too much, too many beads or not enough. So there is also tables that we provide with all of our equipment that shows you exactly what is the amount of beads that you need to uh, mill down a certain product in a certain volume. Uh, again, shape of the beads is very important. Uh, what we are seeing out there is uh, some companies offer very low cost beads, even ceramic beads. But if you look at them under the microscope, you will see that they're not perfectly spherical. So that is a problem because when they're not spherical, and they have edges and corners, then they will wear very unevenly. And that would also mean that you have much higher wear rate and that you will also get inconsistent milling results. So it's important that you always check the quality of your beads when you get them. Uh, you can do that on the microscope and just to ensure that they're really spherical and don't have any corners or, or edges as we have seen on some of the lower cost ceramic bead um, offerings on the, on the market. Um, the tape speed again, really important that 10 to 16 meters per second of tape speed will allow you to optimize the process and get the most of uh, the best uh, milling results uh, in the quickest time. Uh, product temperature. This is really important when we're milling. 
uh, because when we are using beads in the rotor, we are introducing a lot more energy than we would do with the cowl's blade. And therefore, it's really important that we are properly cooling our mill base. So we have two options there. We cool our double wall container uh, or and uh, our basket mill. Or if in the case of a uh, horizontal bead mill, I can also chill my supply vessel as well as my milling chamber as well. So that is really important uh, that we have uh, proper cooling. If you're looking at chillers, we also offer chiller solutions. We're working very closely with Chilabo and we can guide you there with the right products. And all, the rule of thumb there is that you should, the chiller should have about the same uh, kilowatt output as the actual um, media mill or, or, or basket mill so that that uh, um, uh, matches. If the chiller um, power is too small, then uh, your product will eventually uh, heat up in uh, too high and you won't be able to cool it anymore. So it's very important that these numbers match. So if the uh, dispersor or the, the medium mill has two kilowatts of power, then you also want the chiller to have at least two kilowatts of power. Um, then obviously uh, the number of, of passes, how often does my material go through my milling basket or my milling chamber? Uh, that is very important, especially on horizontal mills. I have the ability to to go to do what's called a pass through. So it only uh, goes through the milling chamber one time. Uh, that works with some products, but most of the products you actually have to recycle it a number of times through the milling chamber to uh, get the desired particle size. Uh, milling time, of course, how long am I milling? Each pigment family is different and has different requirements. But again, you can optimize that with the right tip speed. Um, as well as the right bead type uh, that we already covered to reduce the milling time. Um, then the viscosity of my mill base is very important. If I'm too viscous, I'm not really able to uh, pump my material through the basket or through my milling chamber if I have a horizontal bead mill. And that uh, will uh, delay my dispersing results or we will, may never get there because the material is just too viscous. Um, if the material is not viscous enough, let's say it has the viscosity of water or very low, then the problem there becomes that I'm not able to put in enough energy, or it's very difficult to put in the energy because the material is so uh, fluid and in low viscosity that it doesn't hold the energy. So it makes it a lot more difficult to uh, properly disperse the material. Uh, not that it's impossible, but it will take you a lot more time. So always, when you're formulating a product, always look at the optimum um, viscosity range uh, that meets uh, the requirements of the type of media mill that, that you're using. Uh, obviously, the rotor diameter is important that I optimize that as well. Uh, kind of the same idea uh, that I had with my uh, cowl's blade to container ratio. You always want to make sure that you have the right rotor diameter to your milling chamber. Um, then obviously the material of the rotor plays a role. Uh, there is many different types of uh, uh, materials that a rotor can be made of. Uh, standard is stainless steel. There's also hard steel. There is ceramic options, silica carbide or zirconium amongst those. We also have uh, PTE rotors or PU rotors also as an option. Um, stainless steel is not suitable for all applications. You have to be careful. Uh, even though it's a cheaper option, but the tents, because the milling process uh, tends to wear down the rotor and also the milling chamber. So if you're using stainless steel, uh, what could happen is that if you're trying to produce, let's say, a white uh, dispersion or light colored dispersion, that over time it would turn uh, gray uh, because the um, metal would wear off doing the milling process and that would then show up in your mill base. We have seen examples where customers purchased stainless steel, tried to uh, uh, mill down um, a white product and um, TiO2, for example, and the whole slurry turned gray. So to avoid it, uh, you should really use higher quality material like uh, zirconium uh, would be probably the best option there that you would not have that type of discoloration. Uh, and then obviously the type of bead mill that we are using also influences our process. 
or results. So vertical versus horizontal, and we'll, we'll cover that in a little bit. Okay, so this is a great slide uh, showing you that modularity that I referred to earlier. Mr. Getzman's idea has always been develop one piece of equipment that can fit many different needs and can be used in many different applications. So you can see right here, this is the flagship uh, laboratory disperser called the AE model uh, with the beautiful control panel right there. It's a dissolver. However, you can change it to do many different things. So I can add a basket mill to the same dissolver. I could add a vertical bead mill on the same dissolver. I could add a rotor stator, a wall scraping system for really viscous material. That's sometimes very important. Or in some applications, customers prefer to have a vacuum uh, that also could help you get a better dispersion result. This is important, especially um, outside of pigment dispersions that customers are you know, um, producing adhesives, for example, or materials where oxidation is an issue. So they really want to do everything under vacuum. Uh, then we have that option as well. And then you can also add a nitrogen purging valve, another option that would allow you then to basically run this in a dry process um, and, and use nitrogen um, to basically fluidize uh, your, 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 your material. But the good thing is, is that one machine can do many, many different things. Uh, how we do it, we have this quick change system. It's called a uh, QCS, that's the clamping ring up here. And then you would rotate this assembly 180 degrees, it pops out, and then you just replace it with any of these attachments. And then you have a different uh, device. So you turn a dissolver to a media mill very, very quickly. That changeover will take less than one minute. And that's ideal. Uh, for a number of reasons. Also, a customer doesn't have to buy multiple pieces of equipment. You can buy one piece of equipment to meet all your dispersing and milling needs. So that is really unique, and uh, that's great that Mr. Getzman thought of it. So great, great idea. So here's a bigger slide here uh, of that AE model. Beautiful machine. Uh, here you can see the clamping ring, which was talked about, to do that changeover. Uh, here we have a shaft protection pipe that ensures that none of these, uh, no, no shaft is outside of the, of the, no rotating parts outside of the container. Um, they can go up depending on the size to 20,000 RPM. Uh, we offer them in an explosion proof design. This particular model here also has software capabilities. So you can track your batches by name or number. Uh, you can actually set up an entire process for different products and then allows you to later on recall that and reproduce the same formula exactly the same time every time. So that is really important and that is possible with our C technology package that comes with the AE model that you're seeing here on this picture. Um, what's great about it is it also allows you to run instead of a certain speed uh, that you can dial in. We can also dial in a certain amount of energy. Let's say I'm trying to disperse some material and I want to put in 1000 watts of energy. Then depending on the viscosity of my material dur during my dispersing or milling process will automatically adjust the speed to always maintain that certain amount of energy that I'm putting in. Why is this important? Uh, very simple. It allows a customer to now precisely calculate my cost for upscaling. So that means is how, what, what would that cost me to produce this material when I'm actually going into manufacturing because I know exactly how much energy I'm using to disperse a certain amount of product over a certain amount of time. And that allows me to really calculate these production costs, which is very handy uh, when I'm upscaling. Um, and I, with experience, can tell you that all of our equipment really has amazing upscale capability. We can scale up almost at a ratio one to one, which is also very unique um, in the world of laboratory dissolvers and milling systems. Okay, so this particular uh, uh, modularity allows us obviously to use the dissolver in many different ways. We can use them as a homogenizer by applying different tools, not just the cowl's blade. So you can add a propeller tool, a butterfly tool, can use it as a mixer. I can also use it as a rotor stator. 
uh, when I'm trying to blend two different products together uh, and with a high shear. And also I'm able to use it as a disperser and of course as a milling system by attaching either a basket mill or a vertical bead mill that I just showed, showed you earlier. Okay, so we'll dive right into the uh, basket mill process. How does it actually uh, work? So the basket milling is a very easy way of reducing the particle size to primary particle size. So I have an attachment that fits onto my dissolver. Uh, inside of this basket mill right here, I have a, uh, a milling disc. Right above the milling disc sits a, a, um, a, a vortex blade that basically pumps the product or sucks the mill base into my basket mill. The milling disc here with the beads, you don't see the beads on this picture, uh, but they would be in here. That would actually mill my material. Right below my milling disc, I have a screen, and below my screen, I have a cowl blade. So that cowl blade actually serves the purpose of drawing my material back out through the mill, through the screen, and then bring it back to the top, where then that pumping will suck it back in. So I have a very nice rotation uh, or movement of my mill base in and out of my basket. So that is a really nice way of doing it. Uh, it's also double walled. You can see here I have cooling channels going through it. And that allows me to really properly cool uh, my basket mill and, and maintain the temperature that is needed so I don't overheat. Uh, here you can see the drawing here, the beads are in here. So here you can see how the material goes into my basket mill. It gets milled and then put pumped back out through my cowl blade and then push back to the top. So a very nice rotation. Also much easier to clean than a, a horizontal bead mill, just because I can um, just, once I remove my slurry, I just fill up the container with a uh, cleaning solvent um, or, or waterborne solvent, depending on what my polarity, my material or formulation, then submerge my mill back into my cleaning solution and run it for a few minutes. And that would then allow me to really clean uh, my, my basket mill. Um, Depends on the material, of course. Sometimes you have to uh, do that three or four times, but it will really do a good job. There is no bearings. There are no seals. So it's a very easy uh, and well-designed system and very, very user-friendly. And the great thing with the basket mill is that it's very scalable. So here is a picture of a large production scale uh, basket mill. Uh, here is that uh, screw right there is where we actually uh, fill the beads. Uh, and then uh, the rod right here is actually cooling in, uh, fluid in for cooling, and then back here, fluid coming back, cooling fluid. And then I have a third rod back here. That's actually my temperature sensor, which is great. We're actually measuring the temperature of our mill base directly inside of the basket mill, where, where I'm actually having most of my energy being created. And that's also where I have the highest temperature during my milling process. So this is really important. Uh, some competitive units actually have screens on the side uh, here, openings. Uh, we decided, decided against this uh, on purpose because we believe that uh, you want to cool this part and also the top of our milling chamber because that's where you have all your energy. And we feel that a screen on the bottom is most efficient with the combination with the cowl's blade. We are really effectively circulating the product through the basket mill. So, but cooling is so critical that that's the reason why we designed our basket mills with that extra cooling capability all around uh, to make sure we're not overheating our product. Okay, so uh, it's a batch system, obviously very simple design. Like I said, there is no lip seals or bearings or other type, any type of seals really. Um, that you need to replace frequently. So the only thing that really wears out over time is that milling disc and possibly the screen. And these are the two parts that you need to replace over time. Uh, very easy to handle. Uh, again, it attaches onto any of our dispermats. Uh, and then uh, you can also get a nano kit uh, with this design that allows you to use 0 0.2 millimeter beads and um, allowing you to really go down to very, very small particle size um, if you need. Uh, 
Well, on a, on a basket mill, the threshold there is about 400 nanometers. If you have a product or carbon black, for example, where you need to go much lower than that, then maybe a basket mill is not the right solution. We have to move you over to a uh, horizontal bead mill where that uh, allows you to then go down even uh, to smaller particle sizes. But we could discuss this uh, specifically with you, you know, and talk to you about your application uh, if you have any questions. Um, so we have obviously, this is a pilot scale unit right here. Uh, we make them much larger. We also offer a vacuum capability as well. So you could mill under vacuum. Um, obviously the advantage there is, is that you're removing all the air. So the product will flow better. There is no foaming. And also these air, these air bubbles, when they're inside of your mill base, they almost act like tiny little air mattresses and they are buffering the blow of the beads. So that will reduce my milling efficiency. So if I can remove the air, I have a much more fluidized material and that will also improve my milling uh, results. Um, and I can also mill quicker and better. Uh, these uh, two pieces of equipment are um, called the, the Dispermat TM. Uh, that's a relatively new technology, also unique to VMA. Uh, what is really great about this type of setup is, is that it's a combination. You have a basket mill and a dissolver all in one uh, on a production scale. So basically what this allows the customer to do is put, put the dispersions them, uh, uh, right under the uh, mill, uh, under the dissolver slash mill, do their pre-dispersion, and then just pushing a button on the uh, control panel right here, and then the basket mill will get lowered. And now this whole system will turn into a basket mill without the customer having to move blades around or do anything different. He can do the entire pre-dispersing and milling process on one piece of equipment. Obviously you can see that that would save you a lot of time because you don't have to move containers around. Also space savings are a huge added value because I can do everything on one machine and I don't need two machines. Uh, you know, a dissolver slash a basket mill. So this customer here purchased actually two TM1000s uh, for different color families. And uh, they are extremely happy with the results. They run them 24 seven. And um, it's, um, it's a really nice process that they have. Uh, one other thing that I wanna point out is the noise level. Our machines, the motor technology, they are really quiet. If you have ever gone through a production facility where they have 10 or 20 mills sitting, it's extremely loud. Uh, here with this system, it's not nearly as loud as some of the other competitive type of equipment. Um, so that's a really nice benefit. Uh, we also offer the APS system here, which is a vertical bead mill. Uh, that's an attachment that's like a pot mill. We have our milling disc. Uh, we have two containers. The top container is my mill base, and I get uh, filled it up with my beads after my pre dispersing process. When I'm done, uh, I just hook up an air hose to my cover right here, purge my vessel with air, remove a drain plug. Uh, on the bottom of my container right here, you can see that drain plug. And then basically I'm able to purge my mill base uh, through my screen on the bottom here into my container below. So at the end, when I'm done with my milling process, all I have left are my beads. Uh, I can do that in a laboratory setting for, with very, very small volumes, all the way down to 30 milliliters for really expensive pigment dispersions up to seven liters. The problem with this type of setup is that it's really not designed for scalability. So if you want something that you can make in the lab, but you want to be able to produce it in a uh, production environment, then this may not be the right solution for you uh, because you can't scale it up to production. Okay. This is really for somebody who wants to make a lot of pigment dispersions quickly and just look at results. Um, perfect for an R&D lab, but again, not really scalable. Also very easy to clean um, and, and, and use and also no bearings or lip seals or anything of that nature. So that is a big advantage uh, compared to uh, some of the other milling systems. I know we are short on time, so 
uh, want to allow for some questions. I'm not going to cover all these different details, just uh, the important ones. You can also do down nano milling with that APS. Um, um, we offer different milling, uh, aligned milling chambers and milling tools, also in zirconium or ceramic or hard steel. And very, very fast cleaning and quick color changes are some of the key features that we need to point out with that APS. Uh, and then we offer a whole line of horizontal bead mills. Uh, that beautiful uh, little guy right here is the new SL. Uh, we offer that with that C control panel, the new one. And then this is our production scale uh, disperse uh, uh, horizontal bead mill. And we offer also that in different sizes. Uh, the SL is obviously designed to allow you pass through or recirculation uh, mode. Uh, depending on the viscosity, we have different pumping or steering systems. We also have a plunger system. Um, we can go up to 6,000 RPM. Um, different types of milling chambers are available with different linings, ceramic, hard metal, uh, et cetera, depending on your product. Uh, and then obviously we can go down super small here, uh, down to 0 0.3 millimeter, but they have a new one now that actually allows you to go down to 0 0.2 millimeter uh, beads uh, that is now available uh, for very, very small particle size. We have customers that need to go down to sub 50 nanometers. So they would use that type of technology uh, to get these results. Uh, quality control. So there is different control capabilities. Uh, this is, of course, the new C technology I'd mentioned a few times. Uh, and this is just a standard control panel manual. Uh, this one here allows you to see really all the important features, our speed, our energy input, the watts. Uh, we see our, our uh, torque value, which is an indirect measurement of viscosity. We have our tape speed on display up here, a temperature readout, and a timer function. And then again, everything can be stored in a database. And then you can also see the entire dispersing process in a graphical interface with the trend lines in real time. That shows you immediately whether something is going wrong during the dispersing process. If all of a sudden you have a spike in one of the, 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 the lines, like your temperature or energy input, you know something is up and you need to check your process. Um, we also offer for production scale, the capability of using your own control panel, uh, program that depending on your quality control requirements. So that's also an option. Um, we have also, this is just the older software. We are working on a new one. Unfortunately, I cannot show that to you right now, but there is a uh, Windows uh, 11 being worked on, not Windows 11, uh, WinDisp 11, and then basically allows you to then control a lot of these parameters directly from, from your software. Uh, we can do a net power calibration on the AE model, the flagship model, basically allowing you to set an absolute zero value so that none of the torque values or the power input values reflect the machine input itself uh, without the product. So that's really handy, especially uh, when I want to upscale. Uh, that is really nice. Uh, here's just the older software, um, what you can do on your computer, how you can control your process. You can shut the machine off uh, from your office, and then you can, of course, see the entire dispersing process in, in real time. Um, again, lastly, we uh, have a few slides about the different lab applications. So that's a picture of our VMA lab in Germany. We can do a lot of customer trials, uh, and that's the laboratory in Wallingford. Uh, only one side of the lab is shown here. We have also new equipment in here, and we are actually planning to add a laboratory, a pilot scale production capability next year sometime. Uh, we were going to do it sooner, but of course with the pandemic uh, that kind of put a hold to this uh, project. Um, these are the two machines that we added to Wallingford. So we have a new AE with all the different attachments I talked about earlier. And also we have the latest SL machine. So if you ever wanna to come to our laboratory and visit us and do a customer trial, we really welcome that uh, initiative. Uh, we would also be able to tie in our, um, uh, you know, the chemists from big additives that have a lot of expertise with different formulations and product lines to give us recommendations on the proper additives that would work with your product if you wanted to explore that option that is available as well. 
Uh, we could also use this as just a showroom if you want to come in and just review the equipment um, and not run anything. We make time for you as well. Or we can also offer it as a seminar location if you want to bring in larger groups uh, and really get hands-on training on our dispersing and milling equipment and theory behind everything, we would also offer that to you as well. Um, so that's some of these capabilities. Uh, that concludes the uh, presentation uh, right now. So I offer you've uh, opened it up for questions and I appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you, Andy. That was uh, great. Lots of information. I was a little worried if you'd be able to get through it all, but you did, no problem. <laughs> but with a few minutes to spare, how about that? Um, <laughs> if anyone has any questions, just log it in the chat function. We might have time for one or two here. Um, Otherwise, if you think of something um, later, um, feel free to respond to any of the marketing emails you get. Uh, you'll get the recording immediately following this. But uh, just respond to those. Those will come to myself or my colleague, and, and we'll get those to Andy or, or the appropriate person. Um, you know, as you can tell, you know, Andy is our business line manager for dispersion, so he lives and breathes this stuff. So um, he is a resident expert. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to help you out. Or if you're having any challenges at uh, your facilities um, at this time, if you want to share, I'd be happy to uh, unmute you uh, and you can ask it or you can uh, just type it in the, the chat function. Well, while people are thinking about that, uh, Andy, what's the, the, I guess, the most frequent question you get regarding this technology, um, you know, and not limiting it to uh, bead mills, but um, all of this version. Yeah, they, a lot of these questions basically come down to, um, you know, how, e how, how, how it's possible to use a dissolver as a, as a milling system, uh, as a rotor stator. And, and so customers are often very amazed as how easy it is to really make that change uh, to turn a dissolver into a basket mill or um, a, a vertical bead mill. It really takes less than one minute. Um, it's a wonderful way of, of moving from pre-dispersion product over to uh, a standard milling process. And um, and also the basket mill attachment uh, is really awesome. Uh, customers really prefer that route if they can do it uh, over horizontal milling because of just the clean time, cleaning time. Uh, I can clean a basket mill probably quickly in five minutes. If I want to do a thorough job, maybe 15, 20 minutes. You all know if you're working on a horizontal mills that can take you half a day, few hours, depending on the product, the color you're running. Um, so there's really a lot of upsides to um, moving over to a basket mill. And the fact that it's really scalable uh, makes it a really, really nice uh, solution for a lot of different uh, customers products. Yeah, and that's also what I was going to say, the scalability or the flexibility. Um, you, you can start out with a, a small pilot uh, model and then expand that and grow it into full production, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you obviously would need a bigger piece of equipment, but the, uh, the ability to scale almost at a ratio uh, one to one uh, speaks really for the brains and the technology behind uh, the product line. Um, we have a lot of customers that are now using it in production and they couldn't be happier. Um, also, again, with that space savings, we offer, you know, the same modularity and production scale. So the TM that I showed you there was just one solution where the dissolver blade and the basket mill are all integrated into one system. Uh, we also offer uh, where you have the same flexibility where you can add multiple baskets uh, have, uh, on the same dis uh, production scale dis disperser if you have multiple color families. That allows you now to not even clean uh, during your milling process because all you're doing is really changing just the, the head or the basket mill depending on the color family that you're running. So that would then save you a lot of time uh, by just swapping out the baskets on the production unit uh, that can be done in less than two minutes uh, to move that uh, switch over from one basket to another, or just go from a dissolver production scale dissolver to a production scale mill. Um, the space savings and obviously the cost savings for maintenance reasons, 
uh, speak for themselves um, and, and customers really like that solution. That's awesome. Well, thank you again um, today, Andy, for sharing your, your knowledge and expertise uh, and experience with us all. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, we're in the process of putting together our uh, 2022 program, which will we'll have more of, of this, um, more, more topics on dispersion, as well as our uh, other physical test, color and appearance solutions. Um, I think we have one more uh, office hours uh, web seminar scheduled for December. Um, so be on the lookout for that invite. Um, and also, like I said, if, if you think of anything after the fact, feel free to respond to any of the marketing emails and uh, we'll get you connected to Andy or um, one of our other experts. So with that, thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your Thursday and a great uh, Thanksgiving uh, weekend and week next week. See Thank you, everybody. Uh, happy Thanksgiving as well. Enjoy uh, the rest of your week. <laughs>